Justin, welcome to Subscription Stories. Woo! So glad to be here. Thanks, Robbie. <laughs> Yeah, I've been I've been uh, wanting to have you on the show for a while, so I'm very glad to to have you here. And I just wanted to start by um, having you tell us a little about yourself and how you ended up in your current role at Amazon Web Services. Yeah, so great to see you. Um, we've been friends for a number of years, and great to be on your show. Um, let's see, I lead worldwide retail and consumer goods go to market here at Amazon. I, I sit within Amazon Web Services, and so we're working every day uh, worldwide with most of the major retail brands, as well as most of the major consumer packaged goods brands. So uh, if you think about in retail, you might think of companies like Carter's or Neiman Marcus, right? Uh, or in the consumer goods world with companies like Coca-Cola or Heineken. Um, so, um, and we help them to advance their innovation agenda with things we bring from either AWS or more broadly, Amazon. And yeah, I, you know, my background is largely in consumer goods and retail. As you know, we first met, I think when I was at Coca-Cola, um, I spent 10 years there um, at Georgia Pacific. Let's see, I also spent time at in the consulting world at Ernst & Young and Accenture. So, um, but great to be here with you. Yeah, it's it's great to, great to have you. It, you know, um, I wanted to point out that you had me on your podcast um, a few I did. years ago. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And for those that may not know the contender cast, we focus on entrepreneurs. Um, and, and it started off as really, as you know, an entrepreneurship podcast, and then it has evolved and now really focuses on consumer services, consumer products, retail, food service, and and still the founder of the entrepreneur. So what was so cool having you on was talking about loyalty subscription services that go into, right? How these companies are thinking about engaging with shoppers or consumers. So anyway, yeah, that's that was fun having you on. And it's still a great conversation, even a couple of years later. <laughs> yeah, well, I was I was so flattered to, to be on your show and um, found the conversation so interesting. And, you know, the reason I wanted to have, have you here was kind of the flip side of that, sort of what yeah. you can bring to our listeners around, you know, loyalty and subscriptions, particularly for retailers, manufacturers. Yeah. Um, and and you know, what's going on right now in terms of best practices in loyalty? Yeah, it's great. Um I it what's interesting is the last 12 months we've seen a real resurgence in that topic in general. Um, not that it wasn't important before, but during COVID and coming out of COVID, many retailers were just trying to survive you know, keep, and quite frankly, the doors were closed. There was no door to keep, you couldn't keep the doors open. And so um, loyalty the last 12 months has become a, an, an interesting topic for a number of reasons. Number one, retailers are open, they're booming, they're growing, they're opening stores worldwide, different markets. I mean, people are back in stores too. Um, from a digital perspective, you know, we saw the advancement of e-commerce and some of the other tech capabilities uh, you know, years of work happened in weeks, right, to meet the needs uh, during COVID. And so you now have better technology environment to support uh, customer engagement. And then you have better ways of using data and collecting and using that data to drive loyalty and engagement. So all of that's come together um, to power this interest in in loyalty, subscription services as well uh, for retailers, um, subscribe and save programs and, and whatnot. So uh, it's really been interesting and exciting the last, like I said, at least the last 12 months, we've really seen a, uh, a pickup in that topic. Yeah. And are they, are they moving away? I mean, when I think of a lot of retailers um, and certainly in the, in the food and bev space, there's a lot of like points based or collecting caps or mm -hmm. um, punch <laughs> cards, free programs. Um, that are sort of, you get as a result of, I mean, you you get your benefits based on how much you've spent, more or less. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that there isn't one type that's fitting all, if you want to call it that. So whether it be a brands program, like when I was at Coca-Cola, we had a program called Micro Rewards, where you scanned, you know, cap codes and whatnot. Um, and now you have everything from points, badges, challenges, um, you know, instant cash, instant rebate in store, you know, in the food service world, you have, you know, I've bought 10 burritos, now I get one free. There's just so many different variations on it now. A lot of it does tie to an app, um, whether it be in a food service outlet or in a retail store. And then upstream with the actual brands, you know, it's a little more challenging because they don't own that end customer relationship typically. Um, so they typically have to activate through a retailer. 
Yeah. Yeah. They either have to act, I guess they have to activate to a retailer or in some cases they, they go direct, right? They create, a, no doubt. you know, like Nike or, you know, they, they create their own, if they're big enough or their brand is, is strong enough. Yeah, you're right. Um, in fact, many brands do have their own direct to consumer platform. And in that situation, you know, they do own that end customer, um, and they may have stores as well, like you mentioned, Nike. For so in in those situations, they they're you're putting together a profile on you and I as the shopper. They know what we bought before. They can better you know upsell, cross sell, recommend products to us based on what we might like in the future. Um, they can offer uh, re rebates and rewards and promos to us directly um, to trigger new purchases. Right? I mean, these things sound basic, but. The technology is there now and the data to support it that wasn't there in the past. And so it's just a lot easier now to um, to power some of these programs and they don't require like manual intervention. Yeah. So so you and I recently were chatting about the tension between the, the creative and the quantitative, <laughs> the creative and the quantitative. Yeah. Like, I'm trying to be poetical the way I'm saying that, <laughs> the creative and the quantitative. Um, how should a marketing lead think about balancing those two when it comes to building building loyalty to the customer and also creating, you know, those programs, deciding is this going to be a subscribe and save or a, you know, a membership kind of paid membership or a, a points based or, or, you know, earned rewards kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny here at Amazon, we actually have a, a mechanism called working backwards where we say, what's the, you know, what's the, either the problem we're trying to solve or what's the opportunity we're trying to pursue or something to kind of, um, to, to leverage or to help in terms of the end customer experience. So when you think about like, if, if I was a brand and a marketer for a brand or a retailer, whatever you want to call it, um, like I'd be thinking about what's the experience that we want our customer to have online or in store. Um, and where I've seen programs fail or where there's been a challenge, I'll say a couple areas. One, if there's no clear value to the customer or it's just difficult, you know what I mean? It's just, you know, I can never log into the app. When I do, I can't find this place to scan. It's just, and, and then there's, rewards are complicated and I don't get kind of instant it's it's when it's challenging I see programs struggle fail because people will move on to something else um or if there's a, a lot of a long sign up process or um, anything that's lacks personalization you know in terms of the the program or the uh, offers uh, that typically is another reason programs fail um, if it's inconsistent across uh, experiences there's a retail uh, retailer that I work with and I won't mention them but like in the store, like for some reason, they don't have good visibility to my my um, transactions, you know, in, even though I'm part of their loyalty program. And yet then when I'm online, I get a personalized experience. So it's very disconnected. You know, these are the reasons that those programs struggle and fail. But when you think about working backwards from like, what's the customer experience I want to have? And then work back to like, what solutions and capabilities do I need to deliver? That's a good way to think about it from a marketer's perspective. Yeah, it's so interesting because I'm just thinking about you know, like an experience of going into like a department store, like a Nordstrom or Neiman Marcus, where, you know, online, I, I never really thought about that, but online, <laughs> they know my size, they know the colors, they know the totally. brands. Um, they're very in tune with kind of, you know, seasonality for a person like me, like what kinds of things I might be, you know, having events I might be having and weather I might be having. When I go into the store, usually <laughs> the person that that's, you know, working there that kind of greets me asks me what I'm looking for. And, and I would think that, you know, they know so much about me, they should take me straight over to, you know, the brands that I can't resist. Um, so it's, it is interesting. Like you, you realize there's so much more room for a, a really personalized experience. Um, yeah. I wonder, you, you know, you mentioned Carter's and you mentioned um, Neiman Marcus. If one of those organizations came to you and said, you know, we want to build something to drive deeper, you know, what I always talk about with with, mem with membership economy, a forever transaction with our customers. We want to, we want to recognize our best customers, and we want to build something for them. And it, you know, is it points? Is it rewards? Is it, um, you know, some kind of discount? Is it a membership program that gives them access to extra benefits? Mm -hmm. um, is it a subscribe and save? Like, where would you, how would you help them? to go about Think through that, figuring that. it out. Yeah so, yeah. so yeah, first of all, back on your point a minute ago about, um, you know, walking into a store and them not knowing you. The, for those that are, don't work in retail, let me explain a little bit of the tech behind that. So many retail chains grew through acquisition, number one, and haven't integrated like all the technology. But then those that even have their own physical stores, um, 
technology. They built the e-commerce platform separate or that group, like there's two, in many companies, it's like another whole group over there that does e-commerce. And so what happens is you have a great relationship with the e-commerce side of the business and they don't even know you on the retail store side. It's crazy. But many are tackling that now with better integration of data and understanding. And then also putting technology in the hands of an associate in the store so they can engage you and create mm -hmm. A better experience. So just so you know, like, like and for those that may not work in this industry, that's a challenge that we are involved with every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> as far as like, you know, what, what we'll find is when we're doing a, a digital innovation working session with a customer or, you know, thinking about the in-store or online experience, kind of the whole, you know, what's the, the persona and how do they interact with the brand? What we do is provide, we, we share what we can do. What are we bringing from Amazon that may be an enabler? What have others done at other companies that could be useful um, for them to leverage? Or who are our partners? Like we do have such a huge partner ecosystem worldwide of companies that do this really well, or like some of them are really good at managing like customer data. You might call, hear this called customer data platforms. Um, like they're amazing at it. They're known for it. They're doing it many places. And then you might have others that are really good at personalization or really good at kind of the what, points program. Sorry, and when you say partners, do you mean like a retailer or do you mean like another, another tech technology, another technology provider? company? Yeah. Okay. Another technology company. So like, if you think about, you know, what a Amazon or AWS bring, you typically the platform on which you might put these, these types of technologies. So um, a major retailer has a, what's called a customer data platform and they might be using treasure data or Telium or segment or Salesforce um, or or others, but those are some of the major players in that industry. All of those are partners of ours at AWS, and same with some of the other capabilities around like point based uh, rewards programs or the you know the the personalization uh, capabilities and whatnot. Got it. Got it. Yeah. It's interesting. So 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 someone comes in, you have them work back to front, or what do you call it, yeah. backwards? Working backwards. Working backwards. <laughs> um, what are your goals? Um, and then you look at the, what are your technology abilities and limitations? Um, is there, are there any gaps that we can help you with? And then, and then the, is that where the creative part comes in? Yeah, it's interesting. The, actually, we have, um, one of the cool mechanisms we use is we put together a press release with our customers that where they want to think big, right? You want to get creative and think big, you know, here's the experience I want this customer to have with me, the food brand in two years or three years. And we write a press release around it. And then we put questions, we'll frequently asked questions to support it and some visuals. That mechanism can be like almost like a, a big idea or, you know, kind of the, 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 the two or three year plan and then work back from that to say, what do we need to do right now to start heading down the path to get there? The, that's an interesting way to get really creative with the customer instead of focusing on like, what can we do now to affect, you know, the next two or three weeks or the next six weeks or the next three months. And and that's, for me, that's the really important bit here because, you know, subscriptions and memberships are explicitly designed for that reason, right? Long-term totally. relationship. And Absolutely. there, there are so many pressures, I think, facing, especially within large companies, facing, you know, general managers and marketing leads and product people to hit this number this quarter. And it um, is the tension in any public company has to deal with that, right? Especially public yeah. companies. Yeah. And and what I like is this idea of saying, okay, let's spend a little bit of time on the long-term picture. We we have the the bigger the I feel like the bigger the company, the bigger the pressure on this quarter. But <laughs> right. but at the same time, you know, having that luxury of saying, you know, in three years, you know, we're going to be known as the, you know, you know, the top 10% of their customers, um, you know, I, I was just talking about Costco, you know, 96% retention or some, you know, number like sure. that among people who aren't dying, really? right? That like, right. you know, the main reason people leave is because they died. Um, you know, put that into your press release. That's something to work towards, right? That, that Yeah, that that's what's great about it. It also gets the executives into an aspirational mode instead of in the tactical mode. And typically yeah. when we put together, a, um, we call it a PR FAQ, press release, frequently asked questions. When we do that with a customer, it's it's not just IT in the room. In fact, I don't want IT only ones in the room. I want line of business leaders and technology so that we're collaborating on a, a future state that affects our customer, right? And the customer experience that they're having with that brand. And so, but um, when you have that put together and work back from that, it's 
um, it's powerful because it gets people again to think beyond just today. Now, I get it. You need to run the business. We need to op cost optimize. We need to find ways to grow top line revenue now. No problem. We got plenty of those um, things we can do together. But if talking about a big idea and how to get creative, that's a great mechanism we have here at Amazon. Yeah. So, so when you talk, about, I wanted to talk to you about some of the, these different programs. You've, you've alluded to them. You talked about subscribe and save. You talked about premium membership. You talked about points based and punch cards. Um, how, mm -hmm. Can you talk about sort of the, the pros and cons of these or how to, are, are there any general principles or guidelines or things that you're seeing? I mean, you, at Italy, yes, you have access obviously to lots and lots of different organizations sure. um, making different decisions. What, what are you seeing kind of big picture? Yeah. So um, typically, you know, the areas where we've seen our customers really dive in from a loyalty perspective is related to discounts, um, rewards. And a lot of times those rewards are not just percent off, but cash back, you know, for example, or, you know, coupon back um, or exclusive access, like, you know, premium access to certain products ahead of a sale. Um, and then any sort of personalized experiences that, you know, a, a retailer, for example, or a brand can provide. I mean, those are the ways that we're seeing, you know, across the customers we work with um, loyalty really be powerful. And again, um, most of it ties back to an app and, and really knowing you to serve you. That's the way I'd, I would frame it. Um, and those companies that have invested in knowing their shopper or knowing their, their customer and then being able to interact with them across channels are the ones that, you know, are accelerating. And and have they they've been able to overcome this gap that I described earlier of like I have many stores and I don't know the customer there, but then I know them on my e-commerce environment. Yeah, those are the the two problems you described are big problems. The yeah, the um, they are. the channel division between e-commerce and and stores, and then also the the challenge of you know acquisition based growth, where. You know, it sounds so dumb, but it really is such a huge mm -hmm. problem when the, the the data is in different places, and it's just hard to treat that customer the same way across these different these different platforms. Which, of course, the customer doesn't even understand. They're like, "Well, well totally. you know, I was in these two stores. They both have the same name on the front door. Why right. can't you, you know, whatever, find my my history or?" Um, yeah. Now. I will differentiate like subscribe and save is typically a program on an e-commerce platform where you get discounts for subscribing to receiving product on a regular basis or on a scheduled basis. I'll call it, you know, this cause you're, this is your world for pretty significantly. Um, <clears throat> the nice thing about that is you're deriving loyalty because of that subscription and being able to deliver, you know, every time on time and in and, and the schedule that the customer wants and in return, you know, you're giving them a benefit, typically a discount. And so where I see subscribe and save is typically for items that you use regularly, consumer packaged goods, items, kind of grocery, things like, you know, I can't, most uh, fashion retailers are not on a subscribe and save program, but <laughs> if you go into grocery, right, or food or um, commodities you use regularly, you know, that's where you'd see a program like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes, I think that's, that's right. Subscribe and save is if you have a product that people are buying regularly. And also totally. if it's, if it's uncomfortable when you run out, if you can't right. run out. Yes. Right. And by the way, if you guys are listening to this, like, you know, I'm not the expert on that. Robbie is. So like, oh. <laughs> anyway, I know a little bit about it, but you should read yeah. the book and you can learn all about that. So yeah, yeah. but it, well, that's, that's very sweet of you. Um, You know, but I, but I do think you, you have a really unique perspective because you see, you know, like take the, you know, the example of, of Carter's like, when you have a baby, um, they are changing size so fast, right? That you might want someone to, you know, send you, you know, onesies, you know, I need a pack of onesies. And plus I'm gonna have to throw a lot of them away when there's blowouts and, you know, all kinds of stuff that little, little kids get into, um, versus like a Neiman Marcus where you're like, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't necessarily need a new silk blouse every month. Um, I like to choose it myself, but, um, but that's where I think these subscription boxes come into play where it's like surprise and delight. Yeah. Um, and maybe it's not as frequent. Um, and then I think the other one is this premium membership, like the like prime, right. Where it's like, sure. you commit to us upfront and we give you a bundle of benefits, whether that's free shipping or early access, as you said, or, um, access to an expert. Right. You know, right. like the way restoration, like RH um, gray card where you get, you know, access to a, uh, an interior decorator. Uh, 
you know, I think these are really interesting. They're, they're different, they're different models. And I think for some organizations, sure. they can't figure out which one they're supposed to do. Yeah. And here's the thing. If there was one that was blowing the doors off and that was, and it was working everywhere, then it, everyone would be using only that one, but that's not the case. Right. So, um, and that, I think that's why you see this proliferation of many different um, uh, strategies. And, you know, depending on the agency you work with or your background in, in marketing, you may or may not choose to deploy some of these strategies in your program. Now, here's one thing I'll tell you. The technology has gotten so much better and so much more flexible that a lot of this is built into most new commerce platforms, right? So you can you can activate programs like this on top of customer data. And if it doesn't work, turn it off. Okay, in the old days, being like five or 10 years ago, like you would have bought a package and installed a package and had to support that package. And if it didn't work, oh, well, you already paid for it. In the new world that we're in now of cloud technology and um, in, in, in new software as a service, we'll call it, don't, we don't get too technical. My point is the, the capabilities are accessible and usable and you can try them. If they don't work, you turn them off and they work, you expand and, and launch them everywhere. So that's what's really changed from a marketer's perspective. It's much easier now, not even with an agency, you know, you can do it yourself in terms of managing these programs. Yeah, it, it, what that makes me think of is how the role of the marketer is really changing because it's less about, you know, let's call it an 18 month cycle to do something really big and new with, you know, new technology, jazz hands, ta-da, um, <laughs> hoping that people like it versus now where what you're really no. asking people to do is, you know, have a lot of experiments ready to go with kind of clear goals and knowing what the next step is, if that one works or it doesn't really, like, do we do more of it? Do we adjust sure. and keep going or do we stop it? Sure. Um, I'll give you an example. I mean, this is a, a, a bit of a tangent, but a uh, major food brand I work with uh, has a, a, a significant e-commerce platform and was not doing any personalization. Yet. I don't know why. And I found this many, many of our customers do not do personalization, which is to me, low hanging fruit in terms of driving incremental sales. But um, so they tested out uh, what we offer around personalization less than four weeks on a segment of their user base. They found a significant percentage uptick in terms of basket size and then um, an actual sell through. And they were able to deploy that technology and capability in like then six weeks, seven weeks. Okay. You could not do that um only a couple years ago and so and here's the great thing if it hadn't worked it just turn it off I'm not paying for it but that is that is what's different and so yes from a marketer's perspective if i was hiring a, a marketing person today or as i was coaching someone coming up into marketing like what skills do i need it is no longer just creative in fact it's data it's analytics um and it's even be able to use ai which we haven't even talked about today um and and knowing tech Guess what? The marketer's job is highly powered by data and technology. Um, and that's where this is going if you're in the marketing space. space. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. So I want to ask one follow-up question on this um, this this brand that you were saying that wasn't doing personalization and then added huh. personalization. But then sure. I also want to remember to ask you the AI question right after that, because yeah. you're right. We are deep into the interview and we haven't gotten to, to that, uh, which is important. So first, the question um, when when you said this this large um, brand yeah. was not doing any personalization, personalization, what when you said oh they're not doing what what were you what would you have expected then like if you went to their website what were you expecting them to have done that they didn't do is it like okay. in terms I'll of give personalization you an yeah uh, when I land on their site and I'm you know recognize eat or logged in it shouldn't show me the a, a random product on special. It should show me things that I might be interested in on special or on ad or, right. you know, for so, their discounts and potential. So not women's slippers, not diapers. <laughs> right. So, I right. mean, the, the example was, and they even explained, they said, well, actually what we've been doing is we've been putting on sale, like the items we put on sale and like as specials and promos are the ones where we have too much of it. I was like, wait, oh, that doesn't. Wait, so I, I have too much inventory. So that is what is going to be on like the <laughs> promo. Yeah. And, and they were not using any sort of, you know, data or, I mean, any to, to say, well, it's, it's Justin Hahnemann. He would want to do these things. We should. So, um, and that's what, that's where we were able to test it literally a couple of weeks and see the uptick. And it's a surprise, right? All they were doing was showing when I got, I got too many of these items, I'm, I'm putting that on sale and that wasn't working. 
I wasn't driving the the not only was it not driving the sales, but also just kind of the remember the the personal experience and the engagement. Customer. Right, right. Well, the engagement because you're like, wow, the only thing that they have are purple roller I'm skates. Like, Why is that being shown? You know, like literally, and we laughed about it. But also, I mean, it was sitting around the leadership team. Like, they're all there and they're all explaining, kind of looking at each other, like, oh, yeah, not a bad. I'm like. And why have you done anything about it? So anyway, we did. Kind of cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And and the interesting thing is, I'm sure that these people sitting around the table, like we, we're, we're sort of laughing at them, but they're smart people. And there is a Super logic smart. to, we have too many pairs of purple roller skates. Let's get rid of them. <laughs> um, but but there's also, you know, this question of what is the customer experience like if, if I don't go to their site very often. And then the, the first time in a while that I visited, they're offering me, you know, purple roller skates that I don't need. I'm going to a, not buy them, and B, right. not come back. No doubt. And, and you know, it, for all of those that are listening, you, we could each go around if we were to uh, you know, open up the line here and you could say, yeah, you know, this this retailer does a great job. You know, I signed up for the program. I've already got, point, I see the high point totals. I know I've got $10 of coupons. I already got a text from them about like the sale. And then, you know, if it's too much, I can kind of dial that back a little bit. I don't need the text every, you know, like, you're kind of managing it and yet also feeling like you're getting this experience. There's a, uh, a you know, it, you kind of feel engaged and like they're coordinated in their efforts and the others, like the one I mentioned where I don't even know they had a points program or a loyalty program. So. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great example. Um, okay. AI. Yes, Robbie. Yes. AI is not new. Um, it, gosh, it, hopefully you all are leaning in on this one. And if not, I'm going to challenge you to lean in. So, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning um, you've maybe heard about in the past. Um, and and I could give you the whole presentation. In fact, I, if you want, just follow up with me and I'll be glad to do that. But what really became a big deal in, uh, last year, 2023, was this whole idea of generative AI. Um, some of you may have used uh, a tool called ChatGPT or experimented with it. And some of your companies are now experimenting with these models and data and whatnot. It's powerful. And in this space, this is a space ripe for disruption, leveraging generative AI. And the reason is because you can use these models to, to take large volumes of data in your environment, like your actual business environment, and develop the you know ideal uh, titles for your e-commerce listings, the descriptions, the ad words, the kind of everything around that, that, that helps you with your product. And then even... Further, think about loyalty now, helps you, these models can mine data. They can quickly come back with, what are my customers saying? What are their preferences? What are their reviews showing? In seconds, without using an agency or anybody else to, to help you. This is available now, people, okay? Not only that, but like from an image perspective, you can take your products using these models, you the marketer, not IT, and and put your product in all kinds of different environments and then have that served up as part of your loyalty programming campaigns today without paying an agency hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars and waiting weeks and weeks and weeks for them to come back. I mean, like, guys, it is a game changer. And we're still in the early days. We're still in, we're in the early days. We're like in the, not only the first inning of many, many innings. So my point is, if you're not already investigating this, having someone in the business experimenting with this, I would challenge you to do so. And I think you'll find extraordinary benefit from doing so. Yeah, I think that's that's so important. And I what I appreciate is you gave some very, very specific examples, particularly for this audience around yeah. what what are my customers saying? Um, what do the reviews say? How, what are the, the big totally. points? Um, where am I not helping them? Um, you know, and then also the visuals of, you know, create Images. my product on the beach, put yeah. my product <laughs> in a nursery, put yes. my product you know, it's real um, and it can be done in real time in seconds. I'll, that, that same food company, the one we talked about with personalization a minute ago, um, they said, well, we've got like 3000 reviews, you know, on this product. Can you imagine, let me describe how this would work. If I needed to know what the reviews were saying, right? You guys all know where this is going, right? I download the reviews. I would send them to someone or a group. They would then review all 3000 reviews and it would take probably couple weeks of team, right? That just create a report for you, come back, present the findings. I don't know how much that would cost, but um, not cheap. And we took those 3000 reviews and, and ran a text model against it in seven seconds, seven seconds, full summary of the reviews, top points of uh, positive, top points of negative. And I could keep asking questions of 
of the model on those reviews and to learn more. Why would the, the customer be thinking this? What what are the things I need to change? Hey, that would all take about two minutes on 3,000 reviews. Yeah. How long yeah. would it take, you know, to go down that process of, I mean, like game changer. These are these are low hanging fruit items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if you're using it for your personal learning, you know, before you, you know, decide and make a decision on something, it's powerful. And you can actually use these prompts and then these um edited prompts, you know, the interactive, you know, back and forth. They are to to it really is, it is, it is remarkable. And especially Robbie's got like, it down. She, she's she's talking about prompts. You guys probably are like, what is a prompt? It's basically just the your question, if you want to call it that. And yeah. that's exactly right. And you all, if you're in marketing or in this space, you will all know what prompts are very soon. So. Yeah, no, it's great. And, um, you know, we'll put, we'll put a couple of prompts, I think, into the, into yeah. the, into the show notes, um, Perfect. To, to get people started, uh, which I think, I think will be great. Um, and so I had a question for you, um, on, you know, the values of, of loyalty. Maybe you can learn this by, by asking generative AI, but you know, is it more, is it more important to confer status, right? Like mm. I know like Coca-Cola has experimented with some of these things where it's really hard to get, or, you know, a special collector's item, that kind of thing versus just, you know, give me the discounts, give me the free shipping, give me the, you know, the free item because, you know, the free burrito. Um, <laughs> right. How do you know, like whether the benefits should be, you know, financial or emotional, whether they should accrue immediately, like buy right. this, get that, or whether you should require some, some patience. Um, is it just test and learn? Can you, can you ask Dr. AI or <laughs> is there, like, how do you, what do you, like when you're trying, I mean, these are the real questions, right? That people are struggling yeah. with, like, do, you know, do I give, do I give for status or do I give for discount? Um, do I make them wait or do they have to get the, the reward before they walk out of the store or before they, you know, push by? Yeah. So I think you'd find the answer is it, it depends on who the, 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 the customer is and what they want their experience to be with the, their end customer. And there is no one answer because like, if you look at, for example, food service and you go to any number of food service chains that you might enjoy, each of their apps is a little different and the way they engage is different. And, some, you know, offer instant rewards, some are point-based, some are experience in store. I mean, I don't, there's not one answer. I, it, what I do find many of our customers are wanting is like, tell me what others are doing and what's working for them. And then if that customer, you know, that retailer's really got to know their customer and, and think about what that, that customer wants from them. And you can do some research and I mean, but until you test a program out and start adding to it in terms of capability and whatnot. I mean, I don't know how you'd how you would really know because and who's gonna tell you the right answer? Because someone could say, well, someone could say, and the right thing to do would be to say, well, with these other customers we're working with, here's the things that work for them. And then you, Mr. or Miss Retailer, could decide, you know, to go and and either pursue or attempt one of those programs. Um, the keys though, it's got to be clear and tangible benefits to the end shopper. It's got to be easy, right? It, and um, and I, the other thing I would say is got to be personalized. So those are three big things that, you know, the ones that are working, I would say those are three big elements. That Tangible benefits, easy to use, personalized. Love it. Yeah, personalized. And like, and I would say empowered by mobile. Like if you look, I, I, we've done a lot of research on like how customers interact with a brand and mobile across all markets is just, you know, trajectory straight up um and so and we see that in every market that we're working in. yeah yeah that's that's I, I love that that's a great takeaway make sure that yeah. your your benefits are tangible like people understand that the, what the values are getting it's easy yeah. to use um maybe even on mobile um and that it's it's highly personalized i think that is that is super um that that's it's really helpful um i think the other thing that you're saying that i'm hoping people are taking away is that you know, I remember when I first started working in subscriptions and I'd done some work very early on at Netflix and I had a lot of clients that would say, we want to do what Netflix does. And then they would tell me something that made absolutely no sense for them. You know, we want to have a two week free trial. We um, want to have one offering where everything is included. Uh, you know, something that is so unique to Netflix because of what they offer, what their value prop is, how they're positioned. Um, that might not make any sense at all, right? If you have a seasonal mm -hmm. business, for example, like a, 
you know, s streaming sports, you probably don't want to have a year round <laughs> subscription because people are going to cancel in month eight every year. Um, but I think what you're saying is you've got to, you can look at all the examples to get ideas, but then you have to, you can't just copy and paste. You have to really keep going back to, is this what my customer would be excited about? I, I agree. And and who knows better than you, the, you know, we can like, for example, when we're working with a, a retailer or a CPG brand, um, you know, we can share what we've seen work elsewhere. At the end of the day, though, that that customer has to own not only their data, but what they do with that and how they engage with customers or shoppers or what they want to test. Now, what's great is we can help provide the tools also like for them to go and, yeah. and execute on those things. And they're, it's just very flexible now. Try it, then work, turn it off. So. Yeah. That's you're like the box of Crayola crayons. <laughs> well, right. And they're like the artists, yes, right? And, <laughs> yes. And like, so we're known as builders, right? So we provide the framework for building, but also there are package solutions as well. My point is like, at the end of the day, you, the customer know your customer best. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I didn't mean to oversimplify, but I, no. I think about that sometimes that people, you know, get on your platform and they're like, Ooh, there's so many things we can do. Let's, let's do them all. And they haven't thought through what makes sense for them. Oh, right. um, and they're the ones like you can make it all happen, but they have to decide uh, and use some, some discipline and some rigor to, to make it work for their particular customers. Agree. Yeah. So um, we're kind of at the end of our time. This is amazing. And I'm, I'm mm -hmm. loving this. And I, I do think that you know, these loyalty programs and what retailers are doing, they're just getting started and there's so much room for creativity and we're going to see a lot more of this. Um, so I'll probably want to ask you to come back and, and Let's share do it. more. Anytime. Um, yeah, I love it. Um, but before I let you go, um, are you up for a speed round? Ooh, okay. Yep. Let's okay. do it. Okay. First subscription you ever had. Oh my God. I don't know, but I'm going to say Netflix because I, I think that's one that just stands out right in my mind of like a, like I felt like, you know, recurring, you know, and it was yeah. the CDs at home, by the way, for those that yeah. don't remember what that was like. We yeah. Three C the yeah right. right. There are these round things <laughs> yeah, that you right. got and you're so excited. And you had and to send them back. <laughs> in the envelope, red envelope. I think that was a good one. Yep. I love that. Okay. Your favorite subscription today that you're using besides work-related. Uh, it's the um streaming platforms you know paramount plus disney plus um i i appreciate those for example just in terms of access to movies and other content awesome but, yeah apple for sure apple plus big one okay um your favorite question to ask in a podcast that's for my own benefit <laughs> <laughs> i love to start by asking like you you did a bit of it but um you know, before we get to you, Robbie, and your new book or your business, tell me, give us, just, what was the path you took to get here? Give us a, a, a brief story of you. Um, I love to set that up. And then um, I love to also ask, like, what are two or three of the biggest things you've learned from, you know, owning and leading your own business or writing a book or launching, you know, the next consumer brand? There you go. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that. Um uh, that, that was just for me, but probably hope we Everybody other loves advice. Too. I mean, people <laughs> love advice, say... you know, from your guests. So there you go. Yeah, I love it. Um, a tip for writer's block. I know you, you, you know, yeah. you blog all the time and you're pretty consistent. Always make notes. It's funny you ask that. I have a notebook here. I always um, keep this with me. You know, yeah, I got every technology possible, it seems like, but I will write down notes when I have them or ideas when I have them. And so um, I have a lot of uh, unfinished um, writing elements and so but a lot of that's comes from taking notes and then i'll go back to them later and i'll use them so yeah awesome and then um most innovative beverage or unusual beverage that you personally tried as a beverage professional oh, man. that's funny yeah i've worked in beverage for those who don't know i mentioned 10 years coca-cola and then after that i've worked with a lot of food and beverage brands um so i've interviewed some interesting ones on my podcast so when i think about like um nixie sparkling water or poppy um or langer's juice or um just iced tea like i you know you've got some really interesting and he, this is like a home run question for me because i get to talk to these guys every week like the food and beverage space there's so much innovation happening in it right now and the, so those are a couple of interesting 
uh, beverage entrance. And it's because of new flavors, new packaging, new ingredients. Um, and so that's what's kind of driving a lot of that. Okay, final question. Um, something, <laughs> one or two things you've learned, uh, see how quick a learner I am? One or two <laughs> things you've learned um, in your time at uh, at Amazon Web Services that oh, would man. be helpful to the audience? I'll just say Amazon in general. Number one, we have an incredible set of leadership principles and we actually use them to frame like everything we do each day, whether it's working with customers or internally as a team or developing the solutions. Um, second would be the mechanisms I mentioned, the one around the frequently asked questions and press release. Um, uh, another one would be like a two-way door um, mechanism where it's like, if I make that decision, that personalization decision, we're going to try it. If it doesn't work, I can go back through the door. That's a two-way door versus like, you know, we're going to shut down like this part of our business and only focus over here. That's a one-way door. And so I would say just some of the mechanisms here, in addition to our leadership principles, make it a really unique culture. Yeah, that that kind of structure and um, and processes is is really yeah. unique to, to Amazon. I love that. Um, great. Well, Justin Hahnemann, thank you so much for being Woo! a guest on Subscription Stories. It was a real Anytime. pleasure. Anytime. Thanks, All Robbie. Right. Thanks.